Welcome to the Tanya Acker Show. So most of us will not go to the Olympics. Not this year. <laughs> most of us will never get to the Olympics. Some of us will be lucky enough uh, at some point maybe to be spectators. But it's a rarefied world. And for those of us who can't get to the Olympics, you know what I did? I brought the Olympics here to you, to the Tanya Acker Show. Welcome to 2008 volleyball silver medalist, Kimberly Glass. Hey, I hey. brought you all an Olympian. Welcome to the show, Kim. <laughs> Hey there, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you here. 2008 Olympic silver medalist. What does it feel like uh, in volleyball? Uh, mm -hmm. What does it feel like to win and to take the podium and to have yeah. them put that medal around your neck? What does that feel like? Um, I guess the thing is like, there's a lot of pride. That moment, that particular moment was a bittersweet moment. Uh, I think in a way, like you're happy to get the silver, but at the same time, like you're still replaying, like, dang it, like we still lost to Brazil, you know, but, um, but in my head, you know, I only really played for USA because I love playing for something bigger than me. And I loved representing our country. And um, so it's still that very, very proud moment when you're putting this on, because I'm just like, you know, I went out here and I gave it all I got, all that I had, and this team did it, and we did it all together in a unified way. It was so beautiful, um, just the entire process for us at the Olympics. Um, so, you know, it, it was a bittersweet moment, and, you know, we lost someone during the Olympics as well um, through, through um, in the Forbidden City. And so playing and getting that medal, only the second medal that the U.S. women have ever had in volleyball indoor volleyball um it was like a really big deal and really special because it just kind of made things not be in vain you know i uh, just to remind people 2008 mm -hmm. the olympics were in beijing yes. you just referenced losing someone in the yes. forbidden city tell us about yeah. what happened there we were sleeping and we were um you know, just preparing for a really a super late game. And, you know, they woke us up early and called us in, which is really rare. And uh, we had found out that one of our former teammates, um, his parent had been stabbed to death by an extreme Chinese man um, from the north, northern China, I believe, if I'm accurate, um, and stabbed the, the parent to death. And um, so it was really an emotional, very, very emotional um, night game to me, Olympics, uh, because I will never forget specifically them walking through the bird's nest and finally seeing that American flag. And when we were walking through there, I will never, I'm getting chills right now. I will never forget the moment that I saw them there and they just had their flag and they were just going. And I literally, like, I'm super sensitive. so. I just remember like smiling and then like tearing up when I looked at them and saw them and I was so proud and just so happy and, you know, just filled with just joy and also kind of like this weird kind of um, like this, 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 this moment you've never experienced in my life, you know, it was just crazy. Um, so waking up and knowing that that happened, like that memory right then and there, like just flashed through the screen of my mind where I was like, Oh my gosh, like, you know, and just thinking about how our, our people were feeling and, you know, it was just hard. Um, and we went out there and the next game and we said that we were going to play for them and for, for the, for the family. And so I think that that was sad, sadly that brought us together more, um, it shouldn't take, and I, and I go and I talk to kids and stuff and I say, it shouldn't take something super extreme for a team to actually start playing better together. And unfortunately, like we actually started playing better together. When we got to the Olympics, we weren't expected to medal. We were not playing well together. There was a lot of animosity and weirdness in between play, different players on the team. And it was just kind of like a little ugly. And um, I remember going to the Olympics and uh, we were just getting into the dorms. And I'll never forget hearing one person say, 
um, how many more days do we have left? Wow. And this is like <laughs> when we first got there. And I don't, I, I only share this in stuff where I'm never like really filming. This is the first time I'm sharing this out loud like that. And I remember being like, what? And I knew there was like a lot of things going on, but this is like the first day we're getting into the dorms and I'm, everyone's unpacking and I heard someone say that. And I'm like, you're counting down the days. The Olympics, like, this is my first Olympics wasn't yours, but also at the same time, I could never go back and I never did go back, you know? So, um, kind of going off course with it, but you know, I started playing this song every day as a country song. I listened to it every day during the Olympics. And it's the songs like, you're going to miss this. You're going to want this back. You're going to wish these days okay, hadn't gone by so fast. You know, I played that like every day during the Olympics to remind myself that like, no matter what is going on, that like, I got to cherish this moment and try to just engulf myself in it and soak it all up because look what happened. I didn't go to 2012 or ever again. So um, there's just so many like different emotions that happen. And, um, but that was a, a, something that's sad that divided, you know, that broke up a family, you know, and it was a horrible tragedy. There was reporting horrible. on that. I remember, yeah, uh, I mean, it was, it was worldwide news. I couldn't uh, imagine. And, uh, I can't imagine having to play in the midst of that, but let's roll it back a second because yeah. what you're saying is that the team was not tight. So when y'all took the field, not. opening ceremony and really that tight. incredible ceremony, and we saw everybody go, the volleyball team, you're saying, not yeah. the whole American uh, yeah, Olympic yeah, team, yeah, yeah. but your team, you guys were not cohesive until that tragic event brought you together. My opinion is we weren't cohesive until that tragic event happened. Yeah. Is it just the competitiveness amongst teammates? Were there other I mean, things going on? I ain't gotta be real. You got a lot of girls <laughs> You're competing. Yeah. I mean, before that, let's be real. We would go to a Grand Prix, which is like a month long tournament. Right. And you were competing for a spot. So you got to learn how to compete against each other and with each other against everybody else. And you got to, you know, and there's a lot of personalities and there's a lot of people having their own different, you know, stressors and anxieties or whatever it is they're going through. Maybe there's some that clash, you know? And I think the thing is, is when that happens, I think it's kind of like bringing it back to the fact that we all have the same goal and we need to actually, sorry, get over our shit, you know, because it's just like, this is just way bigger than us. Um, and it proved that. Uh, that it was, but we were not uh, together. It was kind of like we would do things and then, you know, like people weren't looking each other in the eye, you know, like after. So like the volleyball, people always make fun of us, especially the basketball girls always make fun of us. Like and basketball guys, every every other sport made fun of us because the fact is we all cheer and we all come together and we high five and all this kind of stuff. And they're always like, what are you doing? Like, why do you get to do that? But the thing is, is like, you can't have one player go and branch off because they made an error or something happens. So, you know, we bring it back in and reel it back in and make it about the team and, you know, looking each other in the eye. And, and so, um, you know, after, you know, the tragic event happened, you know, I mean, the tragedy happened, it was like, everyone was looking, there was a different, like intense look. Mm. There was just something that was kind of like unspoken that I think just ran through all of our veins. You know, it was like, you're hurt, you're sad, you know, you realize that nothing else, like the little stuff doesn't matter anymore, you know? And you walked away with a medal. I mean, after yes. all of that acrimony and then yeah. that horrible, horrible tragedy, you yeah. meddled. Yeah. Uh, so it really, there's a lesson there that sometimes, you know, and you're right, it shouldn't always take a tragedy to pull people together. But when tragedies happen, there sometimes it can, you know, they, yeah. they, they can bring people together. Yeah. Uh, this particular Olympics, Yes. Uh, that we're in the middle of now. I mean, talk about drama. There was all kinds of drama before the games even started. Uh, let's yeah. first talk about Shikari Richardson. She yeah. was disqualified uh, for marijuana use. Yeah. Uh, really dealt with a lot of tragedy. Um, her mother yeah. passed away. Um, a lot there, th her disqualification was and has been controversial. A lot of people say that weed is not performance enhancing, which kind of makes sense. I mean, you know, you don't see people like getting yeah. stoned yeah. and then like running like, faster, Dude. right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So it does seem a little bit counterintuitive, 
But uh, what's your view on her disqualification? You know, Do you think it was fair? I, I will start by just saying, first of all, like I can't even imagine losing a parent, you know? Luckily, I still have mine and I can't mm-hmm. imagine what she goes, what she went through. And um, and I feel for her tremendously. Um, with that being said, also, is that, you know, when you're training for the Olympics, you're Olympic hopeful, whatever it is, we know the rules. Right. And what I think I would say is that she said, hey, I know the rules. I didn't abide by them. She owned it. So to me, I, I kind of got confused what, why there was so much controversy about her being banned for a month because she literally said, this is what happened. She didn't make excuses about it. You know, that's what she, she owned it like a big girl, you know? And the fact is, we all know that marijuana and different substances are not allowed. This isn't just like also, like, you know, America, you know, we're like, we got our rights, we have everything. And that's true, we do, right? But this isn't just an American issue. This is a worldwide, no one is allowed to smoke marijuana, whether they're trying to say that it is um, a performance enhancement or not. Now, now, if we take the situation here and we say, hey, let's open up this for discussion for the future, should marijuana be banned? Now that is a discussion someone can, you know, kind of go visit later on. But to me, she owned it. She was supposed to be banned. And I don't know what the conversation about her being banned was for, you know, uh, that's, that's just me, you know, I don't you get and it. I, you and I had a conversation not long yeah. ago where you talked about the fact that when you were competing, I mean, you couldn't even take, what was it? A Midol. Can't take uh, my dog because there's can't. something in there that's a performance enhancement that you don't know. Um, I can't, I couldn't take vitamins um, because, you know, back more and more supplement companies are making them where, you, you know, you test and they promise that you would never test positive for performance enhancement, but you don't know. And that's a huge chance, a risk you take for training your butt off all your life in order to like, say I took a vitamin that was on the same line manufacturing as something else and something got mixed up in there and now I can't compete because they think I'm doping, you know? And, you know, we just know the rules. And yes, this USADA and WADA, are they, yeah, they're outdated and a lot of their things, they should be revisited a hundred percent, right? But um, we in know, her case, we know she is. knew the rules, she owned it, and you she think that it. her disqualification was fair. Yeah. Do you think that as people have had that conversation over her disqualification, it, I mean, I'm asking you, but I'm also going to throw this out there as my opinion. It seems to me, tell me if you agree, that people kind of conflated the larger conversation around yes. uh, marijuana use and the really racially uh, disproportionate impact of marijuana yeah. and drug prosecutions. Yeah. Uh, everybody, like, if you look at these statistics, you know yeah. that uh, black folks do not smoke more weed, but black folks are way more likely to be arrested for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it seemed to me that there was a lot of, and there's a lot of fair and righteous anger over that issue right. Right. that kind of dovetailed over into Shikari's situation. And yeah. I, I think that they're different because of what you pointed out, because of the Olympic rules, but yeah. they should be revisited. You think, right? I mean, they're I think, outdated. I, yeah. You think they're outdated? You know, if, if there's, I don't know the science behind the marijuana, so I can't speak to that. But if they feel like it's not a performance enhancement, and someone can prove all that, then what is the issue with that? You know, I don't, I don't know. But I agree with you a hundred percent. They're taking this, they're making that a racial issue. I don't believe that this was a race issue. I don't. And some people are going to get mad at me. I don't care. It is what it is. This was. She didn't even make it into that. <laughs> right. She didn't. She, she, she absolutely. didn't make it into that. Everybody else did. Let me tell you about two that I am way riled up about. What is it? Way. First, let's talk about fining these handball players yeah. because they want to wear shorts instead of bikini. I'm just going to, I have to be super candid. It is the creepiest, just, I get it's so just yeah. repulsive. It is. Like you are making these girls pay because you can't look at their bums while yeah. they are competing in sport. Yeah. Tell and me granted, your views on the that. Men, the men are, what are they wearing? I, I mean, I Googled it. I Googled yeah. to see what the men are wearing. They're covered up. They wear shorts. Yeah, they wear shorts. 
So, how, you know, you're going to put some Speedos on them and have their balls hanging out? Not like they would really care most of the time, anyhow, but, you know, it's different with men and women. But you know what I mean? I have a big issue with the, is it the EHF, right? The European Handball Federation, because when I was looking, you know, reading about it, you know, they said they're going to, they couldn't make any changes overnight. But what they can do is take the money that they find <laughs> a sport already where they don't make enough money. By, right. So where they're going to take the money that they find, they took away from these girls and then they're going to put it towards a cause towards sports equality. What the hell does that mean? How about instead of taking their hard earned money and put it towards something that you don't even practice? Right. How about you start with yourself, man in the mirror? How about you start with yourself? You guys make an example here. Don't go give it to a cause that promotes sports equality when you guys don't even believe in equality. It's I mind blowing. If you think about how twisted, I mean, just think about this on so many levels. First off, you're talking about you know athletes, competitive athletes, yeah. warriors, yeah. who one aren't just being told you have to wear this, yeah. as opposed, you know, you have to yeah. wear like this uniform as to that uniform. Yeah. They're being told, unless we can see most of your butts yeah. while you are performing, you are going to pay us money. I yeah. mean, I, I found that is just the most, it's just outrageous, but yeah. three cheers for Pink because Pink yeah. said she'd pay the fines. That girl, I just, I just keep getting chills talking about this and chills about what Pink is doing because she always stands up just for women in general of just owning and loving themselves more. But the fact that she went out there and did that, we know that handball, like, you know, like a lot of sports that aren't like basketball, football, the mainstream sports, you're not getting paid that much. Right. A lot of people are playing off a of heart, but they also rely on that money, you know? And they knew it's kind of like they strong guarded and like they bullied them by saying like, Hey, we're taking that money that you feed your family with, you know, you're taking, <laughs> you know, how it's dare just, you? Because you want to be over, overly sexualized and objectified. Shame on them. It's archaic. It's outdated. And by the way, people are tired of it, EHF. Tired. 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 Yeah. That's another Olympic controversy um, mm -hmm. that clearly got us both riled up. Yeah. I, I and like, here's ah. the other one. Here's the other one, Kim Glass. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to introduce this controversy by showing you a little picture of somebody. You know who this Sick. is? So for my viewers, if you're... If you're watching this, you'll see this. If you're only listening, I'm gonna describe what I'm doing right now. I'm putting mm -hmm. up a picture of this little baby with an afro. You see that little baby with so the afro? Cute. That yes. is little Tanya Acker. Do you see that big pile of hair on little Tanya Acker's head? So that cute. was my baby afro. You can't even imagine my big girl afro now. Yeah. So girls with afros, who are swimming want to protect their hair yeah. and they get these caps that are specially designed for hair with lots of volume, hair that goes right. out as opposed to down, hair that grows right. out. Here's a big fact, people. Some hair grows out, some hair and grows up. down. Out and <laughs> up, some hair grows down. My hair grows out and up. Yeah. So, and I actually, a couple of years ago, um, was working out with our friend, uh, Jeanette. We're going to talk a little more about working out in a bit, yeah. folks. Yeah. I, we were doing work in the pool. And so to protect my mm -hmm. hair, I got yeah. one of these great swim caps and I was so excited. I'm like, wow, all of my hair fits yeah. in the cap. So then cut to the Olympics this year where the Olympic committee says that you can't wear these caps because what was the language? They don't fit the natural contour of the head uh, or nobody the, the needs them. Yeah, something I like mean, that, the normal shape. What the heck's the normal shape of the head? I, I, and look, you know, I, I do think that it's important when we talk about conversations with a racial mm -hmm. impact that we're really clear, you know, uh, yeah. about what feels and what is racist or, you know, what right. we might experience as racist. Um, and what might just be wrong or, uh, you know, unsettling. This is physiological racism, where yeah. you are suggesting that those black women whose hair grows a certain way, that's not natural, yeah. so you got to wear yeah. that other swim cap. Yeah. So I just gave you my long spiel on that. Uh, tell me what you think. Well, I definitely agree with that. I feel like, um, you know, for young black girls, first of all, you don't, like, a long time ago, you didn't see us anywhere. And if you did, 
we were Europeanized a lot, right? And right. for so long, we have been Europeanizing ourselves. Um, you know, I even know a long time ago, it was like, you know, like, oh, if you get your nose done, you know, you know, you would be more accepted, you know, like, you know, and so the thing is, is that people don't understand. They, I've heard people say, we're just making an issue out of this. We're just finding something else to complain about. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, well, the thing is, you don't know what you don't know. And I don't expect you to know what you don't know because you're not exposed to it. But at some point, you have to broaden your myopia here. And you have to think there's a reason why you need diversity and inclusion. Because we're underrepresented in the swim world, are we not? Right. And, and, and a lot of places. Right. And the thing is, it could deter a lot of young black girls and boys from actually like wanting to compete. When I was younger, I couldn't put my head in thing. I wouldn't protect my hair. I couldn't do that. You know, and I, I don't agree necessarily like with what I don't really know the science behind this as well. So I can't really talk about that. But they said, like, maybe it's going to mess with the aerodynamic flow of the water. <laughs> and, I don't know how you, I'm confused. I, here, I, here, listen, I'm going I'm to, I'm going to find, I have Please the do. quote. I have the quote. They said, here's what uh, Fina said about these caps. Yeah. Athletes competing at the Olympic level have, quote, never used, neither required to use caps of such size and configuration. Well, maybe because you haven't had that many black women swimmers. Yeah. But there are plenty now, by the way. Yeah. There are some now. I shouldn't say plenty, but there are some. We have some medalists up in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the statement goes on. Fina also determined that the cap does not, quote, follow the natural form of the head. The quote starts with the natural form of the head. So right. the issue is that these caps, the which are specifically head. designed yeah. to uh, hold our afros, right. like that, that, Afro head yeah. <laughs> that we all yeah. have, that I have, that we have, I know, is not when natural. Is, when this is I, in here, this I, is like this. Exactly. When this is not braided up, yeah. and you know what people see, like I on my show, my hair's braided down. I wear those beautiful wigs because they yeah. keep one, they're pretty, and two, they protect. keep my natural hair uh, protected. And when mm -hmm. I take all that out, there's a big wad of hair, and it's yeah. gorgeous, and I love it, and I don't want yeah. it chlorinated. And I want yeah. a swim cap that fits it. So to suggest yeah. that that's not a natural head shape, yeah, uh, I, I, I thought, I mean, just outrageous, completely I think outrageous. It's super I thought. outrageous. And I, to be honest, it's, I mean, for them to use that excuse on top of it to, to try to validate, try to actually, I think they tried to like minimize what they said about the natural head. And then, and, and then they tried to use an excuse that really didn't makes sense to me scientifically um because when you want to be like more aerodynamic so it's not going to be any type of advantage you know uh you know to have something that you know have big hair like that this That's actually right. helps to make someone more aerodynamic right when you think without but, having all of that pressure yeah <laughs> and having like getting a headache because yeah. the cap's too tight uh, let's switch gears for a moment yeah. uh simone biles as you know pulled out yeah. of the a uh, USA team, uh, the women's team competition. Yeah. Uh, she cited her mental health. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of people were disappointed not to see her compete. But what I've seen, uh, and I'm, it's refreshing, frankly, right. um, a lot of people have really embraced her. You know, I mean, yeah. when I look at that yeah. young woman, not only is she great, she's yeah. got to, it seems that she's you know, constantly being told, you're so great, we can't give you credit for all your greatness. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, she's got this pressure and then she she pulled out. What do you, tell yeah. me what you think about her decision. You know, at first in my head, I said, we're athletes and, you know, you're the top 1%. And um, to me, the gymnasts are some of the most strong-minded human beings out there. And at such a young age. Um, but I said to myself, you know, we, we have to compete under pressure. So I hit up one of my teammates and I said, uh, who's also a mindset coach, Ted Talker, uh, two-time Olympian, one of the strongest mindsets that I know as well. And I said, hey, Nicole, like, talk to me about this because I don't understand the, I think like a lot of us don't understand um, mental health issues, right? Um, and anxiety and panic attacks all the time, right? And I think what, she helped me to understand is the fact is like 
are we, so when, when these girls are taking off, like Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles, when they're taking off, what are they doing with it? Because are they being, who's being proactive here, knowing that there's mental health issues, you know, to be able to pro, kind of like stop this from happening when you finally get to the big stage in the show, you know? So there's more mental health issues that need to be discussed. I think um, because at first I, d- I didn't, I was kind of like, well, we have to still compete through it. But like, can you imagine having severe anxiety, being a gymnast doing flips up in the air? Like your injury versus my injury can be completely different. Mine's the ankle. You could paralyze and break your neck, you know? So I think she took a, a big stand for herself and for her team, knowing that they could still compete and win and, and do well without her. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I feel for her. I'm glad that she, I'm glad of the outpour too. I see everyone posting on Instagram. Um, but mental health is something that I think we all could kind of educate ourselves more on, including myself, to understand it more, to not have that first opinionated judgment of what we think someone should be doing. I think that we all need to go do our own research. There's a lot out there and we could understand it more and have more empathy for someone that is going through that. You know, like I I didn't even know that to this morning that, you know, Naomi Osaka, like she started a documentary, a documentary about her mental health issues two years ago. I didn't know that. Mm. You know, so she's been going through this for a long time. So what is missing like, proactively that she's still going through this still has to um, take off for mental health reasons? You know, there's something that we don't know that's not being talked about. And, and maybe, um, you know, there's there's a mindfulness things that um, they could be practicing with different coaches that we don't. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Maybe there's someone better. I don't know how it goes, but, you know, I support them all. And um, I can imagine because I don't have my shoes and my feet in their shoes. Exactly. And, you know, it's funny, you, know? you, 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 when you started to talk about Simone, you said, can you imagine like being, and I'm like, no, I can't imagine any of that. I can't imagine doing <laughs> right? those things on the vault. I can't yeah, imagine I can't doing be. those things with my body. I can't yeah. imagine like flying in the air like yeah. that. And so all of that. And then if you're not feeling good, yeah. uh, you have to take care of that. Do you think that we as a culture put mm. too much pressure on young athletes? Are we making it too hard for them? Are we raising the stakes too much? Um, I think in general, I think it also starts with parents, <laughs> to be honest. I see it. I see it at home. Like, I don't think kids, I mean, they're recruiting kids so early now, you know, kids don't even get to have fun doing it, especially with gymnastics. I mean, the stuff that they have to go through at an early age, that's why they're so mentally tough. Um, yeah, there's a conversation that needs to be had about the pressures that are put on there. And then also maybe it's just the mindfulness that needs to be happening at an earlier age to help them as, as you're growing up through the system, like all the stressors that we've had to have, like I've, of course we've all been stressed during the Olympics or just growing up from high school, you know, and, but the mindfulness conversation when I was younger wasn't really that big of a conversation, you know, and I'm not talking about when I was in USA, I'm just talking about just growing up through high school and, you know, and middle school, you know, so maybe we start earlier with the mindfulness and working towards that, you know, um, there's a lot of pressures all the time. And I think also some of these parents really, I see it in the volleyball world a lot. I see a lot of like ugly, ugliness from parents. I talk about this a lot. Um, you know, so much pressure for their kids because they want it for them and you can't want it more than your kids do. And I believe also in like letting your kids kind of have some fun, you know, like there's fun in sports too, you know? And so, you know, when, it, when you start getting to college, it becomes business, you know, right. <laughs> you know, so let them have fun up and then let them explore and play different sports, you know? So that's what I think about it. <laughs> How did you get started? So what was your path to eventually becoming an Olympian? Yeah, I was a basketball player in high school uh, and middle school. And I also was a cheerleader. So I want energy and I like it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and so, you know, it's not really normal for like a basketball player to cheerlead. Um, and it was like ninth grade. 
And one of my teammates, love her, Katie Rank, she said, hey, Kim, you should play volleyball. And I was like, I know it sounds really dumb, but I literally was like, that's a picnic sport. Like, no one plays volleyball. I was never exposed to, like, volleyball before. Swear. So I'm like, people play the outside of picnics. You know what I mean? That sounds crazy, <laughs> right? Because I was one of those kids. I didn't really watch a lot. Like, I was outside playing. So, you know. Um, but, um, you know, I tried out and I was just like atrocious. I was really, really bad. It was ninth grade. And um, all of a sudden, like they told me that I made it, but I also had just made the cheerleading squad. So I was like, hmm. And then I was like, I'm going to probably go with the volleyball because like, First of all, I like to do everything. I don't like being limited. I'm like, I'm six foot two and a half. I don't like your boxes. Don't put me in one. And, you know, in cheerleading, like, right? <laughs> I'm like, too big for your box, okay? So, but like, um, but in cheerleading, I was always going to be the base, you know? I was never going to fly. They let me fly one time, you know? So then I was like, you know what? I chose uh, volleyball. And, you know, I just kind of took off from there. I had a really great high school coach, Al Crawford. I've just been blessed with really good coaches as well. And I think that really makes a difference. You know, I know football players who were super talented that didn't make it because some of their coaches, they had like these little, they were, they didn't care enough, you know, they, you know, and they had these connections to colleges and stuff. So I'm fortunate to have great coach that was like, Hey, you should go play in this club. And then the club coaches that were there and they were like, Hey, you should go try out for USA high performance. I'm like, Oh, what the, you know? And I, and I did that. And I went and tried out for uh, USA high performance. No idea what the heck I was doing. Then all of a sudden I get, I make that, you know, small team and we are just training in Colorado Springs. And I'm like, what's going on? And I, it was just, it was super crazy. And then I was there and I wasn't as good as everybody else. To be honest, I just started. Those girls have been playing for a long time. And then um, they asked me to stay to train with the youth national team for like two weeks after. And I ended up staying and just kind of just kept going up the every every year. No high school trips with my friends or things like that. Just practicing all year long, basketball, volleyball, then finally no more basketball and just all volleyball all the time and just learning, trying to be an open book. There's a lesson in what you just said, um, and mm -hmm. I think it's for all of us, especially for younger people. But you just told a story about mm -hmm. starting out not being as good as everybody else. Yeah. But you stuck with it. You didn't yeah. quit it. You didn't say, I'm tired yeah. of these other girls showing me up. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go back and be an anchor in the cheerleading squad. Yeah. You yeah. Uh, stuck with it. Why did you keep up with it? Did you love it? Do you, are you just that competitive? What was the thing? And what would you tell people um, in terms of finding the thing that helps them stick with something when it's yeah. just tough? It's just tough. You know, um, it's so funny you say that because I, I, so when I got chosen to stay with the youth national team from high performance camp, like 15, um, like a lot of the girls were like kind of talk, a couple of the girls were talking about me and I found out from one of my other girls that were there. Right. I'll never forget this. And then, you know, there's a couple of mean girls there. And, um, I guess, cause I always looked like I was going to be like, you know, athletic and awesome. And I was like, crummy. And so, um, I called my mom and I'm like, Hey mom, uh, they want me to stay and train with the youth national team. And my mom's like, that's great, Kimmer. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, come home. I think I want to come home. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> you know? And she goes, what's wrong? And I was like, well, like, all the girls are like talking about me. And she goes, well, what are they saying? And she was like, and I said, that I suck. And and they don't know why I'm getting chosen. And she was like, well, why would they say that? And I was like, because mom, I suck. Like, you know, and she said, my mom said to me, well, maybe the coaches see something in you that you don't see in yourself. And I was like, yeah. And she goes, Kim, you know how to work hard. You know how to give it everything you've got. You know how to listen. Go out there and just play and learn. And so that's the one thing that I did. I, yeah, I wasn't better than them, but I kept seeing my progress. I love to compete. And this was something new for me to learn. And that's why it was kind of like piqued my interest to even play volleyball after she exposed me to it, my friend, is because I like to compete. I like trying different things and something new. And so like, you know, you have to have the high aptitude for it. You can't just be athletic. And a lot of times people always want to put me in this category of being like just you know, athletic and raw talent. But honestly, like I was trying to understand the game more 
all the time. And so I also, to tell other people this, look at the people who are doing better than you. Those girls that were playing. I see what the coaches complimented them on, what they were better at than me, which is most time like everything. But I chose certain people and I copied them. Like I literally did. I was like, all right, this is how she does this. Oh, I see Logan Tom do this. My coaches made me watch her and she was badass. And I would just try to do that shot down the line all the time. Didn't know how I was going to do it, you know, but I did it. I just kept practicing, staying the open book. Um, knowing that you're a blank slate, you never know enough, you know, and just and trying to be coachable, you know, and just getting, sometimes you just have that grit too. <laughs> so I'm sure people are wondering, Tanya, how did you meet this incredible yeah. Olympian who was <laughs> dispensing <laughs> all of her Olympic judgment magic? <laughs> I don't even know if that makes any sense. That's not quite what I meant yes. to say. Yeah, I know. But right? you're with me there. Like, where did you find Olympian yeah. Kim Glass? Well, yeah. here's what I, I, I kind of bury the lead because what yeah. you guys don't know is that Kim was at my house just a few hours ago, hours ago. kicking my butt, which is what she does <laughs> a few times a week. Kimberly it's, Glass is my trainer. Yes. And, you know, I love her. She's so fun. But when she's yeah. here, I really want her to leave. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's normal. It's like that's a love hate relationship. Truth. Yes. That's just but, the you know, truth. Jeanette introduced us because, you know, Jeanette another was Another super trainer. trainer another super yeah. trainer. I, yeah. I, I was, I, Jeanette Jenkins. Uh, yes. Jeanette Jenkins introduced me to Kimberly Glass. Yeah. Um, I call her, like, in my phone, you know, my contacts, your trainer, Kim the Olympian. Yes. Um, yes. But uh, I, I will say this. Sometimes I just don't want to work out. I think a lot of yeah. people feel yeah. that. Um, I'm also aware of the fact that if I don't, there are consequences. There, there are, are, yeah, are, there, are tons of there are body, yes. not clothes, not fit in the same way consequences. There yeah. are, um, but on a serious note, you know, we've been talking about mental health. And one of the things that I think that people are talking more and more about um, in terms and not just in terms of mindfulness, uh, which is important, but exercise yeah. is really a good way to make yourself feel a little better sometimes. Right. I mean, right. don't you think, isn't that your advice to people that it's not, you know, yes, it's about like our waistlines and this and that, and we want to be physically yeah. healthy, but there's a real mental health component to staying active, isn't there? There is. And it, you know, exercising, you know, it's a mood booster, releases a lot of endorphins. And by the way, exercise doesn't look one way, you know? So like, you, you know, one of, one of my clients says, hey, Kim, can we go and can you just teach me volleyball today? And we go in the sand and I'll do that, you know? And, and, and so sometimes it's finding the things that you like. I always tell people too, like, try to do, I have hula hoops in here. Some days I just come in my house, I'll just be hula hooping to music. I don't even care. You know what I mean? jump rope and getting back to things that like, remember that were fun for us before. Hopscotch. But, yeah. Hopscotch, whatever it is that you want to do, hop in the pool. You know, even if you do a walk up the hill, run, walk, talk to your friends as you do it, you know, something's better than nothing, you know? Um, and I think that that's really important. And maybe if you take those steps to it, then you'll see how good it feels. And then you'll want to start getting into, you know, a little bit more strength training, which is really important, especially for women, as we lose bone density, starting at 30, and then we keep losing more and more each year. And that's so important for us, you know? And so, um, you know, I think it's just, I don't always want to train. And we, we got to be like that. I, all, I don't always say, I don't you always seem like it. You always come over and you're like, hey, yeah. let's go. Yeah. And I'm like, Ugh. yeah, no, well, yeah, that's my natural <laughs> energy in general. But, you know, I try to like I come and I I try to ground myself before I go to each one of my clients and show up for for you guys. And I because I'm better. I'm a I'm a better team player. You know what I mean? That's what I couldn't do with Simone Biles. <laughs> I'm a better team player. So I, I'm good when I have to show up for someone else, which leads me to also find someone that you can work out with or do something active with because sometimes that's a motivation as well when you're doing it but but also like don't beat yourself up 24 7 if you miss a day or, or you miss two days just get back on it you know like the work the fitness journey sometimes is really full of starts and stops and if you stop the important part is just to keep starting again and you know it's like life it's, it's about resiliency 
you know? And so I think that's really important to, to think about. And, you know, it makes you feel good to look good in your body, but also inside we need it for our cardiovascular health you have children you want to stay alive for them you have a boyfriend you want to stay alive for him you want to be at your best self you want to treat everyone at work better than you normally do you can use exercise to boost that mood to kind of make you feel better and you feel more accomplished right don't you like i woke 100%. up i chose myself today that's the first thing you did you chose yourself you got to schedule it in like it your life depends on it because your life kind of sometimes really does depend on you being active, right? Especially nowadays when we're sitting at home, you know? One thing about the pandemic is I, I started seeing more people out walking and doing things they never did before. And so I hope that they continued it afterward, you know? We really uh, sometimes, I think, take for granted how sedentary yeah. our lives are these days. I mean, yeah. sitting behind a computer. Yeah. Um, I read somewhere, I mean, I don't, it wasn't just me. I think this is floating around there, but I think they're saying that like sitting is the new smoking. You know, we, yeah. need, to yeah. be, we need to be out there. So before yeah. we go, Kimberly Glass, um, yes. other than getting me into the best shape of my life, yes. uh, we're, getting what, we're getting there, we're getting there. Uh, what's next for you? What are your plans, sis? Um, so... I'm hoping to create some programs online, uh, fitness wise, so that Yay! it can be more than, not everybody can have me come to their house and train them. And um, I, so I wanna be able to be like a little broader with that. Um, maybe start a couple of uh, traveling uh, group fitness. I think, um, Camps, I think that would be great. What? Uh, Where are we gonna go? Where can we go? Oh yeah. I don't even you know what I want I want to go everywhere. I want to go everywhere. I might start in a couple cities. I don't know yet. And then um and then try to get people together and just like kind of just kind of broaden my reach, right? Um, but on top of it, I really want to work with young tall girls on their self-esteem. And I really want to develop a uh, self-esteem camp for young tall girls. Um, obviously it would start first here in California, keeping it local. Um, and then hopefully it'll branch into something bigger than, ex than I can imagine. And I think it's really important. Um, it's something that I identify with. Um, and people, I think that movie on Netflix really kind of showcased like the lack of empathy that people have for young tall girls. Because when you get older, you realize, dang, people really want to be tall. But when you're younger, you know, people are walking around hunched over, set, like ashamed of who they are, of something that they can't change. Everybody thinks, and, you know, it's funny, the grass is always greener, yeah, right? Yeah, like, exactly. so those girls are feeling, you know, the girls your size, and by the way, she's 6'2", yeah. she's a gorgeous, oh, fun, <laughs> like you're just thank stunning and your energy is so wonderful. Thank you. Um, you're 6'2", and so, uh, you know, maybe when you're younger, it doesn't yeah. feel that, you know, you feel like you've got to make yourself shorter. Yeah, you know you're what? making so, yourself smaller. Everybody, by the way, so when Kim and I are working out, she calls me bite size. Um, <laughs> I am not 6'2". Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, like, you're the, bite the grass size always. I'm the family size. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's like the, the grass always seems greener, but that's wonderful that you want to do that for a community of young women who are impacted yeah. by self-esteem issues in a way yeah. that you can really that relate can to. Listen. So yeah. kudos to you, sis, yeah. for doing that. Thanks for paying yeah. it forward. Thank yeah. you for being here. I hope you'll come. I know you're coming back to Definitely. my house because I'm going to yes. see you in a couple of days. I'm see you on Friday. Yeah, I'm going to see you on Friday where you like hurt me and beat me up again. <laughs> but um, please come back to the show. I think it's just yeah. been wonderful having you here. Uh, one cheer for Team USA. Go USA. 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 All right, go Olympics. Thanks, Kim. Love you. Talk to you. Thanks, love you too. Bye, guys.